Welcome back. And if, again, just a little, if, if, if some of you wouldn't mind moving in from the sides just to uh, give uh, easy access to some latecomers and uh, people who have to go to uh, the bathroom and, and, and so forth. A couple of parish notices. We're coming to the conclusion of, uh, of the Theatre Symposium, uh, Theatre Memory Symposium. I'm utterly alive after overhearing the conversation between uh, Rebecca and, uh, and Frank. And uh, um, we have very few tickets left available for the Risen People. So people who, who, who haven't booked for the Risen People who want to see the matinee, uh, uh, um, please uh, make sure you do that before, uh, before, before you go. As you know, we've moved the matinee to 3 o'clock uh, today, so just to, to, to do that. Obviously, tonight is sold out and so is the Peacock. So that's uh, all good. Um, so the final session um, is uh, Disappearing Ireland, Professor Declan Kybert. Declan is Keogh Professor of Irish Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Among his books are Sing in the Irish Language, Idrgha Chultur, Inventing Ireland, Irish Classics, and Ulysses and Us. Ulysses and Us is, for me, was my, uh, I can admit it publicly, was my first way into, uh, into reading Ulysses, which I did about two years ago as a part of the Abbey Staff Book Club, and I'll have a lot to thank you for that, including what he said, if you don't like that bit, skip it. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Seriously, it's a great piece of advice, because you, you begin, you, you, it, it lures you into falling in love with the book even, even, even more, and I think Goromag is a suction Declan. Uh, he has, of course, for many years been chair of uh, the uh, Anglo-Irish Literature and Drama at University College Dublin, and he was, uh, for the first six years of, uh, uh, of my term as director of the Abbey Theatre, he was a board member, and, and uh, Declan is a rare treasure, both as a learned scholar and as a public intellectual, both an inspiring teacher and, to me, a generous mentor. I don't know who rings him more often, myself or Dave McWilliams, but we're always ringing him looking to, 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 uh, to sort out the world and the ideas. And uh, uh, I have a lot to thank him for. He was the man I quoted greatly uh, at my first interview when I went for the directorship of the Abbey Theatre. So uh, I confused them all, I think. That's why I'm still here. Um, his scholarship on Irish literature in both the Irish and the English language from Joyce to an extraordinary essay he has written in the Irish classics on Martin O'Kine on Craney Kill. Uh, to see that essay uh, sitting beside uh, Maria Edgeworth's uh, uh, is an extraordinary insight, and it gives us an insight, and uh, continually does that into Irish culture. And he used that insight to suggest ways in which we can move constructively into the future. Now, whether Declan is a pessimist or an optimist, uh, we shall soon find out. I'm honoured to call him a friend. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Declan Kybert. Thank you so much for the warm, generous introduction and indeed for having me as part of this great festival. It's just amazing. I, I, I want to co quote Keith Richards. It's great to be here. It's great to be anywhere, come to think of it. Um, because I, I, I too was uh, fighting a bug on my chest the last few days. And this morning I realized who I got it from. Um, he took me out for a fabulous meal just before Christmas, but he gave me more than hospitality. <laughs> But it's so wonderful to be here and uh, to be asked to give this talk. And I would like to dedicate it to the great man who opened the entire seminar because I've learned so much from him over the years about Irish writing and Irish culture and the Irish mind. And I'll try and respond in some ways to things he has said and said to me. Um, the other great man, of course, was W.B. Yeats who founded the theatre. And I think Yeats did believe, in some senses, in the idea of commemoration. He said, for instance, the greatest sin a man can commit against the race is to bring the work of the dead to nothing. Now, I think this was a response to a famous witticism of George Eliot, the great novelist, who said once that the best nations, like the best women, have no history. Um, Yeats didn't really 
like George Eliot at all. He thought she was far too rational. He said once, uh, if she had more religion, she would have less morals, uh, and that the religious and moral impulse always destroy one another in the end. Um, and I think he believed in the numinous in a way that George Eliot did not. He believed in a tradition that moved through many generations. Now, if you think about it, Yeats was part, along with Maud Gonne and James Connolly, of the public events in 1898 commemorating the rebellion of 1798. And it's often been argued that those celebrations helped to bond what we call the generation that made the Irish Renaissance, that it gave people like that, who were very different in so many ways, the impetus to come together and write poems and plays, to create political movements, and in the end to create a kind of sense of community uh, in the subsequent decade. And that would be a radical idea of commemoration, uh, allowing a past image to flash forth in the present moment as a source of challenge, potential, and even danger, what has sometimes been called unfinished business. Um, the desires of past generations, of course, are never fully implemented, but they can be reawakened by a new generation in hopes of bringing them to closer realization. I think the French have a brilliant phrase for this, reculer pour mieux sauter, uh, the, the image of a person doing a long jump who takes a step back in order to make a huge leap forward into the unknown future. You enter, you re-enter the past simply to open up the not yet. And that idea of connecting past and present identities is what allows you in the end to feel what an uncreated identity might be like. I think the process is just like the process of writing. The writer always has a present personality. The one who picks up the pen or goes to the laptop is drawing on a past sense of themselves in order to write, but the whole point is to create some unprecedented self by the very act of writing. It is like in chemistry when two molecules collide and they create a new unprecedented form of life and energy. And this is literally what remembering, putting the members of an object together is all about. Things have always been divided, but when you remember them, you bring them into a kind of more complete narrative. And I am sure that that's what Yeats and Connolly and Maud Gonne believed they were doing in 1898. And a few years later, Yeats, I think, spoke for them all when he said the following. And I repeat the sentence. The greatest sin a man can commit against the race is to bring the work of the dead to nothing. We all hope that Ireland's battle is drawing to an end, but we must live as though it were to go on endlessly. We must pass into the future the great moral qualities that give men the strength to fight. It may be that it depends upon writers and poets, such as us, to call into life the phantom armies of the future. Now, he wrote those lines after the triumphant production of the play Kathleen Nihulhan in 1902, a play which he selfishly at the time complained to be, claimed to be the sole author of, but was in fact co-written with Augusta Gregory. But that play became a paradigm for dozens and dozens of plays about 98, put on in the years between 1902 and 1916. And Yeats was sure that there was an electric connection between the one date and the other. Did that play of mine send out certain men the English shot? And we all know what Paul Muldoon wrote. Uh, if Yeats had saved his pencil lead, would certain men have stayed in bed? Um, the emphasis, though, all through Yeats's writings is on not fetishizing the past as a cozy consumer reenactment. That's not what Kathleen e. Houlihan does. But on using its still latent energies to excavate the present moment and therefore to open an uncertain future. They shall be spoken of among their people. The play is really about the future tense. Um, and I think, I mean, when Yeats died, his wife actually said that was the most remarkable thing about him, his extraordinary sense of how things would look after he was gone in the future. And in his great play, The Resurrection, he outlines the problem that is posed by every revolution, that it tries to express something unknown, but only has available the language of the known. What if there is always something that lies outside knowledge, outside order? What if the moment when knowledge and order seem complete is the moment when that something appears? <laughs>
Well, I think we're living in that kind of a moment right now when people believe that the rationalism of the markets rules all, when the great debate between social democracy and capitalism seems to have been stalled. Uh, President Higgins repeatedly returns to this in his speeches and points out quite rightly that the markets are not rational and that some of their greatest fans boast about irrational exuberance. Um, but we are stuck in this culture which the President has regretted, in which people believe that everything can be measured and counted. Um, they believe in college league tables, they believe in benchmarking, uh, rate your professor, rate your student, rate everybody. Um, but Yates is saying it's at these moments that the unexpected erupts, just when everyone thinks things are stabilized um, and values suddenly uh, are challenged. Now, it was a view he shared with the other artists and intellectuals of his day. Uh, Joyce, for instance, kept talking about not the loveliness which has faded from the world, but the loveliness which has yet to come into the world. And this was part of his project, to build what he called the uncreated conscience of the race. It was attractive because it was uncreated, still to be made. And it is the idea that lies behind Patrick Pierce's poetry, because he glimpsed an abstract vision of freedom before it could be rendered in the concrete form of history. Oh, wise men, riddle me this. What if the dream come true? What if the dream come true, and if millions unborn shall dwell in the house I shaped in my heart, the noble house of my thought? Um, I think that the emphasis in the literature of the Irish Renaissance was less on the, pra on the past than on the present, and less on the present than it was on the drive towards the future and that that is the element of it that we should try to recapture now. If the past is railed off and museumized, it will be robbed of its true meaning as part of a wider historical process. We have to remember that that past was once someone else's future. Um, and I always think the people who take away the challenge of the past will do so because they're trying to deprive us of a knowledge of the true meaning of the present. Now, that sounds a bit abstract, but it isn't really. Um, if you consider, for instance, here in this place with the play currently on, if you consider the ways in which official Ireland tried to cope with the image of the 1913 lockout in the year just past, we all know that the organizers of the St. Patrick's Day Parade dealt with it in a certain way. They simply forbade the dedication of any displays or floats to the theme of 1913. That had the merit of a crude kind of honesty. Um, the commercial elite of Dublin was effectively making clear, whether knowingly or unknowingly, that they saw themselves as the inheritors of William Martin Murphy, um, the man who had led the fight against labor and whose newspaper a few years later would call for the execution of James Connolly. Um, the fact that the Paddy's Day Parade itself was founded by the Gaelic League to showcase Irish creativity and self-reliance seems to have been lost on those organizers. You wonder what would have happened if somebody had tried to put on a float celebrating the Gaelic League and Douglas Hyde. Would it too have been banned? But even stranger was the celebration which followed late in the month of August. This was a staged reenactment commissioned by a nervous official Ireland and people were dressed in traditional costume, and actors impersonated the contesting groups. But the whole event was literally cordoned off from the citizenry and controlled by a security firm, um, just as the predecessors were shown, in a sense, cordoning off the Dublin working class. In other words, the commemoration verged on a literal reenactment of the prior scene, um, not, you know, a postmodern conscious, ironic reenactment, but an abli, abjectly unconscious one, um, proving the dreary old adage that those who don't learn from history are going to repeat it. And I think that's what happens when the past is commodified as part of a heritage industry, um, when it's treated as spectacle, something well and truly boxed in, something put in a glass that you can walk around. Um, and the subsequent ironies of that commemoration serve, I think, as a as a bit of a warning about how official Ireland may decide to cope with the Somme 1916, the Sinn Féin election of 1918, the War of Independence, and so on. Look what happened 
up north a little while ago in what was called the Titanic experience. Um, the real past is getting lost and denied because those who fear it fear one thing even more, a full dialogue between that past and our present. So the two zones have to be cordoned off from one another, if necessary, by security firms. And this is because those who are denied some sense of the past are being forbidden to realize the present or the future. Now, I think all that was foretold and realized brilliantly by the writers of the Irish Renaissance. If you look closely at the texts they produced, they're all filled with warnings about the wrong kind of commemoration. Uh, timid souls fetishizing the past because they cannot live in the here and now. Um, I was involved recently in the commemoration of Dubliners on the Feast of the Epiphany, which culminated, in fact, in the Joyce Centre in uh, a dinner, commemorating the dinner that uh, is the central event of that great short story, The Dead. And there was also, I think, an event of the same kind in Usher's Island. I certainly saw uh, someone with a knife cutting a goose in Joycean costume. And, and I, also, I think this was also an exercise in unconscious irony. Because um, if you think about it, Joyce uses that great story to mock the Irish obsession with the past. Um, the idea that all the best singers are the dead singers, uh, uh, the idea that monks will sleep in their coffins. Um, uh, even the dinner party itself is hypocritical because Gabriel Conroy, who speaks apparently extolling his aunts, privately describes them as ignorant old women. Uh, and Joyce uses the whole story to mock the one thing he thought was really, really ludicrous about Dublin, its statues. Um, you remember the statue of Daniel O'Connell is covered in snow the same way that Gabriel's coat is covered in snow when he leaves the aunt's house. And Joyce, who wrote in Exiles that wonderful joke, saying that in Dublin there were only two kinds of statues, one with its hand out saying, in my day, the dunghill was so high, and the other one looking down imploringly and saying, for Christ's sake, how can I get down out of here? Um, but look what's happened. Look what's happened. We live now in a city filled with statues of choice. The prick with the stick. Um, <laughs> I, I remember when the, uh, my predecessor in UCD, Gus Martin, commissioned a bust of Joyce uh, uh, in 1982, the centenary of his birth, and by mistake, two competitors were told that they had won the prize, which is why there are actually two busts, one in Stevens Green, opposite Newman House, and the other one out in Belfield. And I remember the day the one went up in Belfield, somebody broke the, the spectacles, um, which proved that at least one student in UCD had read the opening chapter of Ulysses. Um, uh, and the other one was put up in Stephen's screen, and I remember a man saying at the time, where's the rest of his body? Uh, and saying that someone should have written underneath Joyce's favorite quote about the body, when a young man raved about romantic love and touched his head, he said, young man, the seat of the affections is still lower down. <laughs> but anyway, this man who made jokes about statues has statues of himself all over the place. I thought of it when Frank was asked what would happen if someone woke up and discovered he was a national treasure and he said he would piss himself. I think uh, you very dangerously veered to that too. But I think there is, a, you know, there is a sense in which we should all piss ourselves each time we pass the prick with the stick. Um, I mean, Joyce was the man who complained when he arrived in Rome that the Romans were obsessed with only one thing, learning how to hawk their grandmother's corpse. He was a critic of the heritage industry. Um, and I think if Joyce came back to this Dublin and walked between his own statues, he'd be glad at the healthier bodies of the young people and the adults. Uh, he'd be dismayed that there's still the same amount of unemployment that there was in the Dublin described in Dubliners, and in particular, the same number of homeless but he would be really dismayed, I think, by the fetishization of himself and of the past of Joyce in Dublin. If you think about it, Joyce would have been 16 during that 98 commemoration in 1898. And he probably was young, radical, slightly intolerant, uh, enough to detect a slightly factitious element in some of the old-style commemorators. You remember when Bloom walks past Stephen's Green in a scene in Ulysses, He's described as going past the place where a wolf-toned statue was not 
because the statue had still to be erected in the way that Joyce felt the true republic had still to be imagined. This is why I think he has Leopold Bloom mischievously think, just after hearing a rendering of the 98 ballad, The Croppy Boy, Bloom looks at the sentimental singers in the pub and he thinks, who fears to speak of 1904? You know, why not deal with the present moment? That was Joyce's project. The past was just a subordinate element in it. The same is true, I think, about O'Casey. Um, the 98 image of timid commemoration is well mocked in the figure of Uncle Peter in The Plough and the Stars. You remember he dresses in the Irish forester's uniform and marches to Bowdenstown. And one female wit on the stage says um, she hasn't seen a nicer suit in a pantomime, that he looks like something you'd pick off a Christmas tree. And of course, this was O'Casey's way of warning about uniforms degenerating into mere costume. Remember, O'Casey resigned from the citizen army uh, because he opposed the wearing of uniforms, which he felt would simply mark out the volunteers more clearly as targets for military enemies. And this is what Marx had said lamentably happened in all revolutions, that they declined into costume dramas and became stories of mistaken identity. This is what Marx said. And he was talking about 1789 and the way the rebels in Paris mistook themselves as ancient Romans. An entire people which had imagined by means of revolution it would impart to itself an accelerated power of motion suddenly finds itself set back into a defunct epoch and in order that no doubt as to the relapse may be possible, the old dates rise again, the old chronology, the old names, the old edicts which had long become a subject of antiquarian erudition and the old minions of the law who had seemed long decayed. O'Casey believed that when a real revolution came, the people would, of course, wear their own clothes. And that is why, I suppose, in the play, he shows the Republican insurgents as painfully anxious to doff their uniforms in the later scenes. I used to be critical of this, but not anymore, because I can see what O'Casey and Joyce were saying. They're saying that the imitation of any kind of past model is a kind of slavery because it prevents people from taking possession of their lives in the here and now. It's a bit like what Kierkegaard said. Kierkegaard said, when you go to the pearly gates, if there are pearly gates and if there is a God, and God introduces you to Jesus, Jesus won't say, why weren't you more like me? What he will actually say is, why weren't you more like yourself? Um, this is, I think, what Yeats meant when he produced plays about Cú Chulainn. If you read Yeats's essays, he did not expect anyone to try to be his own Cú Chulainn, to duplicate the figure. He wanted people rather to feed on the same wellsprings of energy and resolution, because, as Yeats said in the essay, all life has the same root. Um, Cú Chulainn was in some sense a model, but he was a model of self-becoming of how you become your destined self, what Yeats called self-conquest. And Yeats actually felt that the mistake made by so many of his contemporaries who misinterpreted Cú Chulainn as a literal model was therefore to present the whole movement as a revival, as a costume drama, so that the gesture of a radical break with the past would not be seen as such. In other words, the very act of revolution is taken away from the people even as they perform it, just like Marx said about those who put on Roman togas in Paris in 1789. The fear is of a new, unprecedented kind of self. This is what Richard Sennett said once about it. He said, revolutions in mirrors, in manners broadly conceived, fail because they're insufficiently radical in terms of culture. It is still the creation of a believable personality, which is the object of a cultural revolt. And as such, the revolt is always enchained to the culture it seeks to overthrow. And I think that is why, as Michael D. Higgins has argued so often, many radical potentials of 1916 were deflected and lost as the revolution was stolen. Um, by the time Kevin O'Higgins could say we were the most conservative revolutionaries in history, that was probably true. But it certainly wasn't true between 1916 and 1919. And a careful reading of the texts of the Irish Renaissance shows a constant mockery of the cult of revival. It's always the middle-aged buffoons like Simon Dedalus who get teary-eyed about the athletic feats they did in their youth 
When he looks at his son, he says, but could he vault a five-bar gate? Uh, this is revivalism. It's the kind that's mocked in Singh, where you have uh, the drinkers at the bar saying, where now will you meet the like of Danny Sullivan, who knocked the eye from a peeler? Or Marcus Quinn, God rest him, got six months for maiming yo's. Or the mad Mulranis were driven to California, and they lost in their wits. Even then, California had a certain reputation. <laughs> um, but for the arch-revivalist, heroism is something that's happening always in the past. It's what Kavanaugh complained about. Culture is always something that was, something pedants can measure. Skull of barred, thigh of chief, depth of dried up river. Shall we be thus forever? Shall we be thus forever? And I think this is the central intuition of the greatest analytic thinker of that movement, James Connolly, which he put forth with amazing rigor. He grew as suspicious as Joyce and O'Casey and Singh of the cult of the hero. He saw in it a confession of impotence rather than a spur to self-respect. And he said quite bluntly, and it's my central point, that in the Ireland of his day, Connolly said, the worship of the past was nothing other than an attempt to escape the mediocrity of the present. Um, copy and paste to Mr. Pat Cox and Ms. Patricia Murray um, before it's too late. And copy and paste to all the future masters of memorial committees and cities of culture. Because I think these committees will do their darndest to recast the past in terms of the timid present. Uh, whereas people like Connolly and Yates and Pierce, they reserve the right to recast the past in terms of their desired future. They thought of history in terms of science fiction. Um, Connolly, dreaming of a social democratic state, said it would be simply a return to the medieval Ireland in which the chief held the land in the name of all the people. Pierce, who believed in child-centered education, presents it as a return to the fosterage systems. Joyce writes the most radical narrative Ulysses encased in the form of Homer. And, and each of them is in fact thinking about the future while in a sense pretending to defer to the past. They are Irish modernists. They gloss their movement with the look of tradition, but deep down they're doing something else. I remember years ago in the late 80s asking a student in UCD what he did with his girlfriend on Saturday night, and he said, it's easy, Declan. We go out and we sow our wild oats. And he said, and then we go into mass on Sunday morning and we pray for crop failure. <laughs> and I said to him, well, of course, you are an Irish modernist. You were in that Connolly Joyce Singh tradition. Uh, you are making one thing look like the other. Um, the trouble with the uh, commemorative penchant is that it's a, a kind of affliction of a community that is pained by economic failure and has difficulty adjusting to modernity and therefore corrals off the past as a kind of reservation. And even those poor people who have to emigrate are invited back then at intervals to view the reservation and nod approvingly. There's a great essay by Freud in which he wrote about this kind of thing. The reservation is to maintain the old condition of things which has been regretfully sacrificed to necessity everywhere else. The mental realm of fantasy is also such a reservation reclaimed from the encroaches of the reality principle. Now, there are many echoes, of course, of the Irish Renaissance period in the current crisis, not just in Ireland, but all over Europe. I believe that the youth of Europe in this generation has been sacrificed by unelected bureaucrats, not to guns this time, because nobody needs guns anymore, but to mass unemployment. And policy for many peoples in Europe is dictated by outside powers who appear to have found willing accomplices in the local leadership of sub-prefects. What little authority elected leaders retain uh, seems to be draining away, even to the point where we elect people to parliaments, but then subcommittees of three or four are actually told to run the country, and the idea of a parliament as a democratic instrument is literally mocked and taken away. Uh, the crisis at the center of Europe now, as 100 years ago, is first manifest all across the periphery, but it's eroding the center too. And the current generation of political leaders thinking about how best to secure 
benefits from the next election. But all over Europe, deference to those leaders is draining, evaporating. It would be interesting to see in the European elections whether the European Parliament itself is filled with Ming Flanagan's and Mick Wallace's elected from Greece and Italy and Spain, not just Ireland, uh, because of the sense of frustration about the project. Now, a century ago, Irish writers and intellectuals and thinkers decided to reject that situation and literally to be authors of their own meaning. And a lot of what they did was totally absurd. I was reading last week about a Gaelgore who tried to invent a completely new kind of alphabet. But a great deal of what they, those people did was brilliant. They created a great modern culture. They became the first English-speaking people to decolonize. And they chose to derive, as Yeats said, from themselves to invent their own world, what Yeats called, as I say, self-conquest. And Yeats said that all style came from that kind of self-conquest. They understood that the only way to be original is literally to go back to origins, not to imitate them, but to tap into their unused energies. I remember reading a great interview with the woman in the west of Ireland, and they were talking about wrinkles. She had a very wrinkled face. And the interviewer said, oh, you must have been very debauched in your youth to have so many wrinkles. And her answer was, no, it was actually the opposite. Uh, people get wrinkles because of unused experiences, about, because of all those times when the passions knocked and we were not in to answer them. Um, and and, and I, I think in a way, um, the idea of unused energies still in the past is, is what animated our inventors of our country a hundred years ago. They saw to it, for instance, that the literature of Irish and Anglo-Irish writers was available in cheap editions. They read and argued about the texts, but as a way of building a roadmap to the future. A few years ago, when I was on the Irish Manuscripts Commission, I asked its members to produce a handbook of key texts of the Irish Revival by people like Tom McDonough, Hannah Skeffington, Maud Garn, and so on. And, and they voted not to. And those who voted not to were all historians. And I thought, well, you know, in the 1990s, the formal study of history as a central part of the secondary school syllabus had been abandoned. Maybe I shouldn't be hurt. Maybe I shouldn't be surprised. Uh, but I think the lack of belief in a future among so many people at the moment arises directly from our uncertain sense of the past. Um, People in power, particularly, rarely imagine life beyond the next opinion poll. And I think it is the reason why so many young people are emigrating, as they did 100 years ago. Um, many of the, those who go, as is pointed out, have jobs. Um, but, and, and they believe in a future, as all young people do. But they're not, to, they're not really encouraged to imagine a future here. What a contrast to the futurology of Yeats, Joyce, Pierce, Augusta Gregory. Augusta Gregory, who said once in an essay, I'm not preparing for home rule, I'm assuming it. Um, we can expect the leaders of our current uh, junta to gift wrap all these past dates which are now looming into view and to hire the right kind of historians to produce an official version. And its sponsors have actually been tuning up for years. Um, I remember 1966, I'm that old, and you weren't allowed to mention Connolly's socialism, and it, it wasn't mentioned in the official record. And I was brought to see Pierce, uh, a, a version of Pierce in the museum behind a glass, but Pierce was reduced to a military uniform. All those liberal ideas about child-centered education didn't get mentioned. I remember 1991, the 75th anniversary of the Rising, and the Irish Times leading with the most amazing headline in its supplement, they died for a seat at the European table that those rebels went out and died so that we could control the sale of prawn-flavored potato crisps, and so on. In other words, I, I think the script has already been half-written, and it won't revolve republication of too many of the books of the real inventors of Ireland. Um, this cult of commemoration was critiqued brilliantly by the psychiatrist Franz Fanon um, as a sort of repetition compulsion which he said gripped many newly independent African states once they realized their economies were failing. And he saw it as a kind of neurotic repetition compulsion. Um, 
that, that, that the leaders alienated the neurotic from the actual present, but also from the real past. And instead they produced a kind of mantra about that past, which they used as a narcotic over their people. It's, this is what Fanon said. The leader pacifies the people, unable really to open the future. We see him endlessly reassessing the history of the struggle for liberation. The leader asks the people literally to become drunk on remembrance. I am sure that that amazing sentence is the one that was in Conor Cruz O'Brien's mind when he mischievously observed in 1971, we Irish are in danger of commemorating ourselves to death. Um, if if O'Brien were still alive now in 2014, he might want to rephrase that judgment. His followers certainly are doing so because it's very interesting that so many who led the revisionist critique of old-fashioned Irish traditions are the very ones who are now publishing books uh, on 1916, 1913, 1918, etc., etc. The very ones who told us we couldn't talk about this past 15 or 20 years ago are publishing books containing, you know, relics of the lockout or postcards of Easter week. The people who declared these subjects off limits are now trying to control the narrative, but in a slightly different way. Of course, the leaders of the, of, of the Renaissance feared that Ireland was about to disappear. And Ireland has always been on the point of disappearance. Um, an early death is always, as Elvis Presley knew, a good career move. And there's a sense in which this has been going on as long as the country has been talked about. When I was a teenager, I remember looking for Irish writers in Eason's and Hannah's, and there wasn't a separate section devoted to them. Um, Edna O'Brien was beside John O'Hara. McLaverty was beside Mailer. Uh, the first chair of Anglo-Irish literature was founded in an Irish university in UCD in 1964. But in that year, the booksellers of Dublin still didn't recognize Irish writing in English as a separate ca uh, category. Um, and, and, and then, of course, it suddenly emerges in all its glory, and the bookshops are filled with sections on Irish culture. And at that very point, when I was a student in the 70s, all the cooler, hip young people didn't really warm to it. Uh, they produced books with titles like Paddy No More. You had co-op books. People wanted an international style. They got fed up with the way the Abbey Theatre put on a singer and O'Casey for the summer tourists because the young people wanted, wanted to be counted one with Borges, Brock and Benjamin, not Davis, Mangan and Ferguson. And I remember a great debate sometime afterwards between the two foremost Johns of the Irish contemporary novel, Banville and McGahern. Um, Banville said, I want to open a window on Europe. This was the man who'd written about Copernicus and Kepler. And yes, said John McGahern in his sardonic voice, and I suppose you think I'm trying to slam it shut. Um, the irony, 30 years after that exchange, is we can see just how much Banville's Copernicus novel is about the clash between Catholicism and Protestantism in the Northern Ireland of the 70s, and about the attempt to introduce science onto a central position in the school syllabus in the South. I once interviewed Banville and asked him how he could so unerringly recreate the late medieval world of witches and spells turning into the world of modern science, and he said it was easy, Declan. I grew up in Wexford in the 1950s. Um, but the other irony is that McGahern uh, focused on North Leitrim and seemed an utter regionalist. And yet we know now in his writing about that place uh, was drawing on Flaubert, Proust, Tolstoy, Saint-Beuve and the whole European and indeed global tradition. Um, there's no doubt that Irish writing has been globalized since that debate. Um, uh, even as people from Nigeria, Africa and Eastern Europe flowed into the country, writers like Colin McCann and Colin Tobin made a point of setting entire novels in New York, uh, in Central Europe, in Central America. Um, and yet it's interesting, each of these writers gets renationalized as fast as any bank. When Colm Tobin is reviewed in the New York Times, he is the Irish writer, Colm Tobin. Um, and, and, and there is a sense in which, even as the multicultural Ireland that emerged from these changes in the late 90s and noughties uh, came to prominence, um, 
a, a sense in which the Ireland that seemed to be disappearing kept reappearing in official accounts. One of the reasons, I think, is that so much of that traditional Ireland had been suppressed in the revisionist years. Um, there's a great book called Strangers to Ourselves in which Julia Chris Davis says that we encounter the stranger in others to encounter the hidden lost parts of ourselves. And she says in countries like France, which receive a lot of immigrants, the right wing is always fretting about the national culture and how it may be endangered by waves of immigration. And the left wing is more attentive to the culture which the incomers are bringing with them. Um, of course, a true modernity works when the two cultures fuse and there is a sense of real creativity. I think this actually happened in the early years of the Celtic Tiger, up to about 2002, that many of those who came in had a thoughtful, critical interest in Irish tradition, but were also very proud of the cultures which they brought with them. Um, but after 2002, I think there was less thoughtfulness. There was a kind of bling culture which afflicted everybody um, uh, equally. That was, of course, the year when the currency changed and we lost the old banknotes uh, for those anodyne European ones. I remember, many of you will, you know, banknotes which contained the image of Yeats. Um, Michael Yeats used to say to me that when uh, his children were going out and wanted money to go to a disco, they said to him, Dad, could you lend me a Yeats? Because I think a Yeats was worth 20 quid. Um, and he would say, no, would you settle for a Swift? Um, <laughs> um, but, but, but then we got um, those Euro notes with bridges that are almost faded even as you handle them. I, I, I think that in some ways the uncertainty with which writers still deal with incomers, and the uncertainty is obvious in that great phrase beloved of the Irish Times, the new Irish, as if they're all apprentices to Irishness, a ludicrous idea. But that uncertainty is partly caused by a lack of confidence in what it is to be Irish anyway, which has been eroded through the years by various forces. If we wanted really to create a true multiculturalism that was in some way earthed in this actual place, the books to read would be the classic books of our tradition, Gulliver's Travels, Castle Rack Rent, Ulysses, Beckett's Trilogy, because even though they came out of a seemingly monocultural world, they are all about encounters with the other. Um, they explore alterity, and they do it brilliantly. Um, I remember w w when last I taught Ulysses in my final class in UCD, asking the students about Bloom and Stephen, you know, if they had met an interesting-looking 38-year-old, slightly Jewish man in a dive in Dublin at 2 in the morning, and he invited them home to, your kitchen, their, to, their, to his kitchen. I said, would you go? And they all looked and shook their heads and said, not in your life, Declan, certainly not. I said, that's a measure in a way of what has been lost. A hundred years ago, people in Dublin did not shirk such encounters with the other. In many ways, the seemingly multicultural Ireland is in, 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 in many senses much more monocultural. And the old monocultural Ireland had a kind of multi-element about it. Um, I remember McGahern saying to me not long before he died um, that, that um, I asked him, you know, how, how he found it when he went to England and what it was like imagining people in the streets of London. And he said, oh, it was no problem at all, he said, because when I grew up in Leitrim in the 1940s, if you got up on a bicycle and cycled 10 or 15 miles, you were already in a foreign country. The people's way of walking, moving their bodies, speaking was totally different. So he said a bicycle, as we all know, was a sexual opportunity in those days. Um, but it was also a passport to a kind of multicultural world. And I think that is true. And I would believe, and, and Fiuk said, am I an optimist or a pessimist? I'm a cautious optimist and a guarded pessimist. I do actually believe a renewal will come in this culture. Um, and it will come significantly, I think, from incomers. If you look at the history of modern cultures elsewhere, um, even look at English poetry, it was completely renewed by an American from St. Louis called T.S. Eliot. Uh, 
who came in from the outside and reminded them of Spencer and The Tempest and everything. If the English novel was renewed by immigrants with names like Conrad and Henry James and eventually by our own James Joyce. Um, so many of the thinkers of the Irish Renaissance owed a great deal, not to, just to England, but to the continent. So many of them indeed came back from these places to make Ireland a crucible for modernity. And I would hope cautiously that this is what is about to happen again. Thank you very much. on the one hand and on the other. Um, thank you, Declan. We, we'll obviously open it up uh, to questions and a conversation. We've, we're, we have a good 20 minutes, and this will allow all of us... Uh, obviously, Declan wasn't at, uh, at some of the sessions. He was sick uh, uh, with the flu. Uh, but you know, if you want to start to look at picking up some themes from previous discussions, I mean, it's interesting how uh, Mark Curran's uh, presentation yesterday on the marketplace and how that was picked up symbiotically by, by Declan around, around, around the, 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 uh, the control of the marketplace. But also, I was moved by, uh, and you wouldn't have known this, but I was moved by uh, Wayne Jordan's uh, presentation of his wonderful uh, production of The Plow and the Stars uh, around the, the tension he had between the dialogue of the present and the past in terms of his own biography and how the production uh, was resisting, f maybe in the first production, but the second one uh, not, in terms of resisting his own reading of, uh, of it and his contemporary reading of the play, you know. Mm. So there's, there's um, I, I have one curveball question which I'll leave for another while, but the, uh, just the question around, I'm interested in, the, in your comment around uh, or the theme around the lack of confidence of being Irish. Hmm. Okay, um, and you as a scholar, and, and you as, as a, a, a peripathetic anthropologist too, uh, uh, could you just expand that a little bit or, uh, around? I mean, is it that there is? A, do you, do you, are you suggesting there's a lack of confidence in us at the moment, being Irish? Is it a, is a lack of confidence in ourselves as, as, as citizens in this republic? Is it? Uh, and, and who's controlling that narrative? I mean, you're very clear that, that there is, and you can see it whether it's the publications of the, the, the hundred objects or it's, there's a controlling narrative occurring now that I and a lot of us are trying to are, are, are need to catch up on and perhaps uh, um, challenge. So I'd just like you to maybe expand on that a little before I open up to it. Well, I, I mean in one sense you've only told them the newspapers and you read complaints about how our leaders do not stand up for the people in the wider theatre of Europe mm. um, and that they are too easily rolled over. On the other hand, people will say that 10 years ago, the Fianna Fáil leadership, let's say, was appallingly arrogant in its dealings with Europeans and pissed people off. It looks like a kind of bipolar cycle, doesn't mm, it? Mm. Going from extreme self-assertion to a kind of timidity. Um, and I think it is connected in some ways with being an island people and, you know, goes right back to the myth of Irish exceptionalism uh, 100, 150 years ago. You know, on our good days, we are going to be the saviors of the world, like Patrick Pierce taught every second day. And on our bad days, we hunker down and we're worse than anyone. Um, I think it's also to do with the removal of a sense of the past, though. Like I said about history being marginalized on the syllabus in the 1990s, I think that a lot of younger people are looking for insignia in a way of Irishness. But then it gets reduced, as you were saying, to objects. And the story has to be told through the radiant object, uh, rather than as part of a continuous narrative, which is what I was trying to gesture towards. And I, I, I do think that, uh, well, there's a wonderful sentence in J.K. Rowling. She says, every subject should be taught as history. And she was asked it about magic and alchemy, which is so important in the Harry Potter books. But she said, really, geography, 
maths, literature, everything in the end has a history and the history of the subject must be taught so that the subject itself is understood. If, if you remove that sense of the continuum of time, you really are depriving people of a lot. And it isn't just to do with time, it's also space. And my generation is guilty of this. I, I used to complain about my kids having no sense of the geography of Dublin. But I was guilty because I was driving them from one experience to another. Whereas when I was their age, I walked those streets and I got to know the geography. And in a way, I think the sense of history and the sense of geography are what my generation have deprived younger people of in a way that may be culpable. And is that a similar, uh, is that a similar uh, dichotomy uh, in 100, uh, of 100 years ago? Is, is, is it the, trying to get the balance between the, a knowledge of history and being a slave of history? I mean, that tension uh, and the reason we're having this, this colloquium here, this symposium here, is that you know, at what point do we just need to say goodbye to history having understood it? Or, yeah. um, and uh, and the, the dead and tan, and I said this in my introduction to uh, uh, Michael Dee's uh, 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 speech, is that the, 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 we'll, be, we'll become wary of the dead and tan of the state in how it uses history. Hmm. And at what point do we, or are we confident enough as a, as, a, as a society to understand history and yet uh, let it go to inform the present and indeed interrogate the future? Well... I, 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 I read Richard Carney's lecture and have talked to him about it over recent months. I think he's right in implying that we become slaves to anything, including a version of the past, if we're unconscious. Most slavery is unconscious. Mm -hmm. Like I was saying, these repetitions, these unconscious repetitions of 1913 by foolish commodifying commemorators these unconscious repetitions of the very thing Joyce is laughing at by Joyceans. Uh, in the same way, if people have not fully transacted the past, they will become fixated on it, but they won't be really aware of that fixation mm -hmm. because it's below the level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the psychoanalytic reading is so interesting and why you know, people like Fanon, who was a psychiatrist, have so much to say about post-colonial societies. So the curveball question before we open up, um, what advice would you give to arts organizations and indeed the Abbey Theatre about how it should approach uh, commemoration, how it should approach, I mean because there's, there's already there's, uh, uh, there's, there's what I would call health warnings from government around the world, I, I noticed the word sneaking in, uh, a decade of quote sensitive centenaries, right? So already, <laughs> already, already the ideology of government and the state is look, you know, on the one hand and on the other. So, so I, 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 it has it a debilitating controlling started and how, what kind of advice would you give artists uh, uh, and uh, a lot of theatre makers in this, in this audience and including ourselves in, in terms of how we might approach it or should we learn from, I mean what you're saying is interesting you use the word, uh, you, you use the word renaissance not revival. Yeah exactly. Of, and that's the first time I've heard that you, mm. saying that publicly that actually it wasn't a revival it was a renaissance or maybe, mm. so it just maybe help. Well, I, yeah, no, I mean... I can't turn to the Irish Times for help in this I'm, one, right? I'm, 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 I'm like Frank McGuinness. I would never tell any artist to do anything. Um, uh, but I do think uh, newness, look for the new. The, really don't, as Bob Dylan says, don't look back. It is much more important to think of five new plays that would excavate the present moment and in so doing will tell us about the past anyway, incidentally. But if we start making the past the central focus, we won't do anything. Um, I think there are ancillary things that could be done. I gesture to it in the lecture. I really do think there should be a handbook of essays by, you know, 20, 30 figures from the Irish Renaissance. I believe that if that kind of a handbook were produced, it would be something journalists could quote when they're writing op-ed columns. It would be something that senior secondary school kids could use in essays and debate around. Um, and, and, and we would have, you know, a, a, a sense of the past. But I, I would never tell artists what to do. I don't think... I don't think you've ever tried to do that, really, have you? I failed. In that. <laughs> I haven't. No, I and, and I mean, they don't even tell them, as Frank was saying, they don't even tell themselves what to do, mm. so why should we? Mm. But, but the thing is to, to, to seek for, for newness, for the unprecedented.
And that is the only duty you, well, what Oscar said, the only duty you owe to history is to rewrite it, but, so, but, 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 but not to reproduce it. So we should start with the phrase, who fears to speak of, 19, of 2016, should we? Well, 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 yes, but there's a danger even in what I said of fetishizing that date. Yeah. I remember, like, through the bailout, the whole idea was, well, you know, we'll be ready to erect a podium in O'Connell Street just when the micromanagement of the economy by foreigners is stopped and even the vestiges of the Troika have gone. I mean, people who are anxious always project a symbolic anxiety onto a symbolic date. Remember the year 2000? We all thought the planes were going to fall out of the sky and the computers would fail. Uh, it, it's dangerous also to put too much pressure on any one year yeah. and think, you know, you could start quivering with intensity about the Abbey program in 2016, but it might be better to just see how the chips fall and what comes in, because that's what Yates and Singh and Gregory had to do. Yeah. Yeah, and not to plan it, I think. That's, that's, uh, we, we need not to, kind to of, overplan it. No, yeah. not to overplan it, which I think, but there will be, a, there will be that resistance. Uh, you, know, you can see the state limbering up now in terms of, uh, of, of you know, controlling it to the point where, not necessarily to control the message, but controlling what they might fear might be the tensions. I mean, it's interesting what's happening in, in the north at the moment and what's happening in terms of the very, very fragile peace process. And there are intimations now that we have to be careful or mindful Mm -hmm. I'm hearing that, certainly, in Leicester House, mindful of how we might approach commemorations in light of contemporary. And you've, of course, written very well about that, about 1991, uh, in particular about the uh, uh, elephant of the revolutionary forgetfulness. Isn't that right? Yeah. Well, Freud said we fear most the past that returns. And obviously, there's been a tremendous nervousness about history because of the troubles of the last 35 years on this island. And you can understand why particularly historians were nervous. But it's got to the point where they were almost self-cancelling. Like I said, they voted not to produce a handbook like that in the Manuscripts mm. Commission. And, and, and it's as if they're in some way afraid of this encounter with That's the right. past. Yes. It's the return of the repressed. But, 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 you know, in 1991, for instance, uh, people like Robert Bala were denounced as, you know, hyper-Republicans for trying to hold an alternative commemoration that week because it, the state wasn't doing enough. The state commemoration didn't even provide five deck chairs for the five veterans who still remained from the original moment. Uh, and Bala got denounced when he tried to produce a substitute commemoration. But the strange thing was that one of the people who turned up to Bala's commemoration in the post office was none other than Conor Cruz O'Brien, the main architect of the critique of so much of this. So it's, it's almost as if people will do it anyway, even in spite of themselves. Yeah, and I think the, another emerging team that came, that came from... Um the last couple of days, which I know you didn't touch on, so, but, but it's, it's the, just the role of sexuality, the role of gender, the role of not only the history of the women, but the role of sexuality within plays. And again, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it just because he's in the audience, but both um, uh, Frank McGuinness's work uh, uh, on sexuality, male and female, and also coming, uh, coming out very strongly in his work and also in Wayne Jordan's production of Plough, that, uh, that, that sex is, has to come back and is coming back into the stage uh, and how that might be treated along with what's happened, of course, post Ryan Report and post, uh, post the, the notion of, 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 of family and protecting families. So there's a lot of stuff I think that we can excavate, actually, that perhaps people might want to, might want to side on. And we can go back, perhaps, to the proclamation, which I know is something that you didn't mention, but uh, uh, on, on some of the themes coming out of that that we might address as well. Hmm. Okay, questions. Uh, and we'll start just down here. Aoife, I think it's Luke Gibbons. It is Luke, yeah. And then... And when you finish, Luke, just pass it on to, I think I see Jim there. Uh, there as well. Thanks, uh, Declan, and thanks, Fieke. And indeed, thanks for staging this event here, because I think one of the... <laughs> I, I think one of the kind of thrusts of a lot of the presentations is that we don't just remember the past. We perform it. We actively perform it, and theatre isn't just a, a building with four walls. Theatre takes place in everyday life. It takes place on the streets. And in one sense, I would like to just ask Declan maybe about one of the paradoxes of, if you like, consumer Ireland or Celtic Tiger Ireland or indeed postmodern Ireland is that according as lifestyles become more and more um, centre stage, to use the phrase, 
so if the rebels were to have a, a new rebellion, it would probably be Dundrum Shopping Centre they would have to occupy <laughs> rather than the, the GPO. But w that w w one of the paradoxes is that while all this has taken place, when the Queen came to Ireland, and I say the Queen came to Ireland, uh, one of the headlines in Metro, I think, was forget history. We're here mm. for the fashion, looking at what Queen Elizabeth was wearing. But while that is taking place, I think one of the most encouraging countercurrents coming from this symposium has been how much history has become more and more hands-on, not least of which is due to digital forms, due to the digitalization and access to new kinds of histories. And when Katrina Crow and Patrick Lonergan and Fergal talk here about the amazing amount of hits that have been on the 1911 census, the 1901 census. People have never been more interested in history and can't have enough of it. Local history organizations are flourishing and thriving. Where I teach at Maynooth, there's over 100 monographs in the local history series produced in the last few years. So I think one of the most positive dynamics coming from this is that in one sense, history is still alive it may even be toxic in the sense it should be, in that what, these are different histories than the histories of the past. These are not the royal road to the present. These are the roads not taken. These are the unapproved roads. The people who did not get their names in the papers. The people, so families are looking up their own histories. And the way history was taught in primary schools was, was no history more dangerous than your own history. We were taught nothing about local history. It's only now, 100 years after the event, with the military bureau papers, with the pensions papers, that we're actually finding out what happened in your own locality. So in one sense, there has, it's almost like Joyce's method in Ulysses, bringing history down to every man, mm. bringing history down to the shout in the street. It's almost as if these new forms of histories are coming through, and it's remarkable. So when um, 15,000 pension um, documents now are going to be accessible, these are, are histories that impinge on probably every one of us here. So Declan, could you say something about that, that probably Joyce's best legacy to the present is to bring history down to the shout in the street, to the people who do not make, even, even Bloom's name was spelt wrong in the Evening Telegraph, mm, mm. When, even when he made the newspapers, he didn't make it. So could you say something about the history of the people who have only walk-on parts, the people who are, if you like, the unnoticed and the unremembered? Yes, I mean, history from below is what you're talking about, and it's supremely important. The problem is it's not always preserved in documentary form, and what we were told was history when we were young had to be document-driven, hadn't it? And we're learning now that oral tradition is at least as important and that there are other ways of apprehending the past. But I have a question back for you. All that you say is true, but why is it then that the number of people studying history in universities is dropping. The UCD numbers have dropped over recent years. Why is the number taking the subject in the leaving cert in crisis? This is coincident with all that you've described, and it suggests some kind of disconnect, doesn't it, between the formal encounter with our history and what you're calling all these brilliantly intuitive informal ones. Um, that's a very worrying thing in a way. And I think what I'm saying is true and what you're saying is true, but they're both you know, pointing in different directions. Um, you know, what is the explanation of that? Is it that the, no, I mean, the demands made on students in academic courses were excessive? I remember my own kids saying, if you did history in the Leaving Cert, you had to write for like three hours and 40 minutes or something. And so many kids now find handwriting quite a physical challenge, even for an hour when they've grown up on, on laptop. I don't know what it is, but you know what I'm saying, that there's a sense in which uh, a great deal of this activity is extraterritorial, so to speak. It's beyond the curriculum. It's also interesting that the inheritors of James Connolly's are the, are the one who are driving this change, you know, that actually the, 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 the history in the curriculum is, is, is completely becoming more and more marginalised. Well, it was a Labour Party minister who marginalised it in secondary schooling in the 1990s. Well, it's repeating itself for the, uh, as yeah. well. Okay, next question is Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, for your, yeah. Sorry, Jim. Thank you for your... Sorry, uh, Jim. Thank you for I hate taking the mic, but I just hate to go back. I would, Jim Ryan is my name. I would hate to go back to Dungarvan without saying a few of the thoughts that have been welling up in me the last few days. It's been such a magnificent, wonderful conference. In a, nearly 60 years of theatre going, it's one of the highlights of my... Uh, uh, one of the best times I've ever spent in a theatre. And I just feel... I think for your, if... I'd be delighted if for the next four or five years, or whenever, however many years, you, you and your organizing group would take charge of the commemorations. <laughs> you know, if if right. the last few days is anything to go by, it would. Write, write to me this at Jimmy Dean, because they're not allowing me in, I'll tell you that. Well, I might write a little to the Times if I had time to sit down and think about it. It's been so magical and so wonderful, you know. Um, and I, I'm nearly coming to a conclusion as well that I personally will have nothing to do with any commemoration event that has politicians next or near to organizing it for, as well. You know, because, you know, as I get older, I'm looking for truth, you know. Truth, you know, and I was at an event about a year ago, and I asked a question. You know, it was on history and that. And I suppose the person listening to me, he heard my voice, and he sort of, he came to certain conclusions, and he jumped down my throat. You know, and I was just asking a question, you not know, because we come from one tradition, and I'm trying to find out the truth as I get older, particularly. You know, but um, you know, it's it's been staggering what we've had he here this morning, even. You know, we had Tom Clone, and wasn't it wonderful to hear the realism? What war is really like? You know, wasn't it fabulous to hear the impassioned the reading he gave us there? Then, of course, I think Frank McGuinness there this morning, it was like T.S. Eliot's poem, Proof, or something, a man putting his heart and soul there uh, out on an X-ray in front of us in a, a display of searing honesty, honesty and integrity, you know? I thought it was so wonderful. And, of course, Declan, you're all, always an absolute joy to, to, to listen to, you know. And, uh, now, Jim, uh, have you got a question? Because we're going to move on. Uh, uh, well, we'll, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> we rarely get praise, so I want to hear it, but we need to move on, <laughs> all right? Uh, well, yes, and well, I suppose, uh, Fierke, another, I'll add to your problems. Any hope on earth that one of the great anti-war plays that I ever saw might be rejuvenated, revived, that's the Silver Tassie. And thank you, Fierke. Okay. Thank you, Jim. May I just because so there's a man up. There's a man up 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 here. No, sorry. There's a man before you. Before you, yeah. Um, Aoife, a, it's right up there, halfway up. Uh, it's in my hand. I just think we rest. <laughs> I think we resonate with this because our DNA, our psychic DNA, our spiritual DNA recognizes the truth that we're all looking for and that will set us free, that it's written in our DNA and we cannot deny that and we recognize it coming through all these artists. Okay, thank you. That's lovely. I'm glad I heard you now. <laughs> could, could, could I just, I, it's not a question, but I, I just want to endorse what you said. I, I'm so much older than you are, Fia. I can remember. <laughs> you always have been, Declan. I, I, yeah, I can remember. I can remember the 1960s, and this is brilliant. It's like the teach-ins we used to have in 1968 and nine, because just lots of minds and bodies in the same space trying to, you know, brainstorm. There've been so few big public meetings around intellectual or imaginative themes yeah. for decades mm -hmm. in this place. It, it, this is why I think we all feel so much gratitude about this. And, and we, we should be grateful to each other for turning up too. That's what I meant about the Keith Richards joke. I mean, it is an amazing moment. And, and, and uh, I only hope there'll be lots more of these things in the years now to come. Uh, you know, and to be honest with you, and I said this on Thursday, it's, it, 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 it's, it, for once it comes from the top, it, it came from our president who gave a fantastic speech at the American Irish Historical Society in uh, 2012, and it was out of that that uh, this, this emanated. Yes, very quick question, yeah. Yes, uh, Declan Marcus is my name. Um, Declan, you, you talk about the fetishism of, of the past. I mean, is there not a fetishism of the present that equally paralyzes our society? You mentioned this tragedy that there is so much unemployment and recession and poverty in Ireland. But, I mean, when you read Joyce and you look at uh, the, 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 the situation of, of Mrs. Purifoy in Hollow Street Hospital or the dire poverty that he described in Dublin, I mean, does that really exist today? I mean, are we the same? Um, um, is our economic priority, is this notion that 
unemployment is a tragedy. Is that really, really valid when you consider that poverty in Ireland is, is relative today and it's not an absolute? People are not in their bare feet. People are not starving. It's a relative poverty. I don't have what somebody else has and that makes me poor. That the real poverty in Ireland is one of intellect, that you're far more likely to find a dog-eared copy of the Argos catalogue in a Dublin household than you would find a copy of Joyce's Ulysses. That, that this fetishism, this belief in our poverty and recession and that we have to uh, somehow stimulate economic growth, that that's, if not equally paralytic, to use Joyce's, Joyce's phrase, it's in fact more paralytic. Mm. Well, my drawing room happens to have both a copy of Ulysses and the Argos. <laughs> and um, I, I am quite sure that if Joyce could be magicked into it, he would head straight for the Argos catalogue. <laughs> And, and Leopold Bloom too. Um, I know what you're saying and I said it myself. If he came back he would be pleased at the healthier state of the bodies of children and adults. But it is a scandal given the levels of affluence that there is so much unemployment that some people are busy, busy, busy beyond endurance and other people literally who have immense talents are not being asked to do anything. That is a scandal. Um, It's also to do, as you say, with present tenseism. Uh, I said the politicians don't think beyond the next opinion poll. Some of them, I think, are not even thinking as far as the next election. But it is really dangerous when you have a whole body politic that doesn't imagine dead people having votes, having some say, because they did help shape what we are. I remember, do you remember the 1969 election when Jerry Fish was elected by a narrow margin on a recount of just five votes, and there had been massive personation, and Conor Cruz O'Brien sent him a telegram saying, Jerry, I can only quote Pierce, the fools, the fools, they have left us our Fenian dead, um, because so many dead people had, in fact, voted for Jerry Fish. <laughs> but, but there is a literal imaginative sense, there's an imaginative rather than a literal sense in which that should be true. We should imagine our predecessors having some say in what we're doing, but equally imagine our yet unborn children and what life will be like for them. And I think this is part of the scandal of the current leadership, that it, it has mortgaged the future of our children, uh, not just here, right across Europe and in what is called the developed world. It doesn't seem to love the environment, the natural environment, and in fact, we don't even allow kids kind of to see it anymore. It's narrated through media. The weather people will tell you what's going to happen tomorrow rather than you learning from your granny to look at the birds or the dogs and work out when it's going to rain on that basis. There's, there's a sense in which all this present tenseism you're talking about is to do with the impoverished culture you speak of. But the only way to cure that is to open back a sense of the past and of the future and to insist that politics reflects this, and not just, you know, the plays of Frank McGuinness, but the actual speeches of our leaders. Thank you, Declan Kybert. So... In conclusion, and I know a lot of delegates were asking us what are we going to do with the papers. We, we've yet to decide we, on how we will publish them. We will be publishing the papers, uh, whether it's all in one go or, or online over, over a while. So we'll just watch and keep us, uh, an eye on our website. So just a couple of thank yous. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, our president, Michael D. Higgins, who really inspired this and set the agenda for us. So thanks, um, Secondly, uh, his chief of staff, I know, the patron of the symposium, uh, Professor Declan Kybert, who really encouraged us and kind of almost let us alone and guided us and gave us blessings when I had to ring him in panic and stuff. He's a, he's, he's a gem, and thank you, Declan, personally for that. Um, We have a couple of visionaries in the room who uh, indeed uh, don't even live here. They're, they live in, uh, in, in New York, um, who s supported and, uh, uh, and funded this symposium. Uh, this was funded uh, through a uh, very generous uh, donation by our friends in, in Boston, but also uh, Jennifer Doyle and 
Roy Lennox, who, the librarian, librarian and trustee of the American Irish Historical Society, and I want to extend our gratitude for that. It's, uh, it meant that we were free to speak our minds. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge uh, over 20 actors and directors, uh, the Fish Amble Company, Company SJ, who involved, and, and we did all the rehearsed readings, and, uh, uh, and we have another one this afternoon. Uh, I want to thank them. I want to thank um, the board of the Abbey Theatre, a lot of them who attended, and in particular, uh, the constant support of uh, our chairman, uh, Dr. Brian McMahon, who, who, who's, who's with us as well. So thank you, uh, Brian, for that as well. Of, of course, all our speakers. We had 32 speakers over three days, a uh, 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 large amount of them uh, artists, and it was great to hear them challenge us and challenge themselves and to kind of listen to each other as well. And I really want to extend my appreciation to all those artists, without whom I certainly wouldn't be here. And thank you to all of them. Very, very important. Again, we're only the sums of our part, and, and I have to say I have the privilege every, every day uh, of working with an extraordinary team of people at the Abbey Theatre, from our uh, wonderful sales and customer team who look after all of us here, our production department, all our Abbey staff who made this uh, whole event so smooth, who've given me support, who've given the artists, more importantly, the support, and I just want to personally, as director of the Abbey, want to extend all my thanks to all of my staff and the staff of the Abbey Theatre over the, over the last week. And finally, to my co-conspirators, uh, we have a, a committee of three: um, Adrian Howard, director of uh, literary director of the Abbey Theatre, and Kelly Feelin, who uh, casts our shows, but was also the convener. And of course, Kelly was the one that we dreaded to meet every Monday morning when we hadn't done our homework and we had to uh, ring the, those artists and encourage them. But the, between the three of us, we uh, we kind of been working at this since last March. So I want to extend my, my thanks to uh, Adrian and to Kelly as well. So thank you, and I'll see. You. I hope we will, we were go we're going to do another symposium next January, but I hope to see you a lot more often between now and then. Okay, Gurmeet Mahagav.